Statements has concluded. Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Uh, my questions to the Prime Minister. Since this House last sat, the government released its response to the recommendations of the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. Can the Prime Minister please update the House on the implementation of the important recommendations of the Royal Commission, which will help address the wrongs suffered by the survivors of child sexual abuse and help keep children safe in the future? The Prime Minister. Yes, sir. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> the, the Commonwealth has accepted all of the recommendations that relate to it from the Royal Commission. Uh, the tragic events of recent times in the Northern Territory, and particularly the assault on the young girl at Tennant Creek, is heartbreaking. Uh, the protection of children is our most sacred duty. The, I have, I'll ask the Minister for Social Services to, to go into more detail about precise measures that we're undertaking in the Barclay area, but I just want to say that we have, we recognise, as the Chief Minister Michael Gunner has said to me, that we're dealing with uh, very dysfunctional families uh, facing enormous challenges of substance abuse. Uh, the Chief Minister has recognises that, as indeed the Acting Chief Minister acknowledged quite explicitly, that the Territory Government has failed these children. Uh, they need, as he's acknowledged, to have more senior child protection officers working in the community who have greater confidence to intervene earlier. Also vitally important to ensure that people with cultural, particularly speaking about Indigenous communities, people with cultural authority are engaged so that the child protection agencies are working with the Aboriginal communities and people with cultural authority uh, to ensure that there is that support that is provided both from government and from the community when families are failing their children. But I'll ask the minister to add to some of the more specific measures that we're adopting. The Minister for Social Services. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thanks, Prime Minister. Um, as the Prime Minister has said, there were specific recommendations uh, which we are working with the Northern Territory Government on, the most important of which is a joint review of children and families' funding and services. Uh, we are establishing a tripartite commission. Uh, that commission will uh, meet in the coming weeks. We are finalising the terms of reference with the Northern Territory Government on that tripartite commission. Uh, obviously, we are trying to expedite those terms of reference <coughs> as quickly as we possibly can. And I use this opportunity to say to the Northern Territory Government uh, that we look forward to the, the first meeting of that tripartite committee in the coming weeks so that we can get on with implementing all of the important recommendations which were made by the Royal Commission. The member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister outline to the House how a strong economy helps to create jobs and enables the government to guarantee essential services, including record funding for hospitals and schools, including in my election of Dunkley? Is the Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. Mr Speaker, 90 per cent of Australians work in the private sector, and more than half of them work in small and medium Australian family-owned businesses. And they are the businesses that are investing, encouraged by the reductions the Sydney, in company the tax Bendigo. already legislated. They are the companies that are investing and are employing. And that is why, Mr Speaker, last year we had the highest jobs growth in Australia's history. And that is why, Mr Speaker, we see GDP growth at 3.1 per cent. We're seeing that strong growth because the government is providing the incentive to encourage Australian businesses to invest and get ahead. And of course, what that does, the stronger economy 
enables the government to have the revenues to provide record funding on health and education, to be able to agree with the states a new five-year public hospital funding deal which will add $30 billion in additional funding, $7.5 billion of which will go to Queensland, Mr Speaker, where the Labor Party is out there once again lying and saying that the government is cutting funding to public hospitals. Every year the funding is going up. And you know what the greatest risk to public hospital funding is? The greatest risk to schools, the greatest risk to having life-saving jobs, Mr Speaker, it would be a Labor government because a Labor government would not be able to manage a stronger economy. It would not be able to deliver <clears throat> the revenues that you need to pay for all of these things. Look, this is not a question of theory or speculation. We know, we know <coughs> in the last Labor government they were reduced to the point so poorly were they managing the country's finances that they couldn't put life-saving drugs onto the PBS. They couldn't do it. They couldn't Members do it. On both sides. They were holding them back. A heavy price. The for Ballarat. A heavy price paid. And what we're doing <coughs> is, as those drugs are recommended, we are putting them on the list. We are putting billions, billions of dollars more into public hospital, into Medicare, into medical research. All of that is possible because of a stronger economy. And without a stronger economy, it is simply not able to be done. And Labor demonstrated that. A stronger economy ensures we can fund the essential services Australians the deserve. The Prime Minister's time has concluded. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Treasury has confirmed that the entire $42 billion stage three of the government's personal income tax scheme goes to the top 20 per cent of income earners. How is it fair that under this government a banker from Vaucluse earning a million dollars will get a tax cut of over $7,000 a year, while a hospitality worker from Caboolture will only get a tax cut of $10 a week and will have their penalty rates cut as well? The, Prime Minister has the, call. the government's comprehensive personal income tax reform plan will see Australians in the first instance of lower and lower middle incomes getting a tax refund, Ten, over $10 million, in fact, and over $4 million will lies. get the full $530. But then, when the, pro, when the program is complete, when the reform is complete, the marginal tax rate will be 32.5 cents from $41,000 all the way up to $200,000. And what does that say to aspiration? What does that say to people who want to get a better job, who want to get a promotion, who want to work some more hours? It means you will not Member be paying more and more tax with every extra dollar you earn. And, Mr Speaker, I would say to the honourable member who asked the question, the person on $41,000 has aspirations to earn more, to do better, to get ahead, and they want to do better. Oh, and look. Look at the dismissive gestures from the opposition. All right. So the hospitality worker the in Caboolture, and the member I for Bendigo the Labor Party would like that worker to earn no more than they are today. Well, I tell you what, we're on the side of enterprise and aspiration. We want Australians to have every incentive to member get ahead, to warm. have a go, to do better, and we know, we know. That by 24-25, there will be many, many occupations, school principals, police superintendents, that are not normally regarded as being part of the millionaire banker class of Vaucluse, who will be earning, who will be earning, money, earning an income that gets up towards that $200,000 mark. So what we want to be able to ensure is that for that, for that uh, part of the tax system, the income system, 
there is every incentive and no disincentive for people to do more, to have a go, to invest, to be ambitious, to aspire and get ahead. And the Labor Party members may, may seek to dismiss that in the contemptuous way the honourable member opposite did a moment ago. I say shame on the Labor Party. They used to believe, they used to believe in workers getting ahead. They used to believe in giving people a hand. Nowadays, they sound very much like a privileged elite that wants to keep the workers in their place. Members on my left, the member for Gray has the call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The <coughs> member for Gray has the call. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the most recent national outcome, uh, national accounts data, and how this affects the economic outlook provided in the budget? And is the Treasurer aware of any risks to these budget outcomes and the health of the Australian economy? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Gray for his question, because, like all members on this side of the House, we went to the last election and we said to the Australian people, we will deliver jobs and we will deliver growth. And since then, Mr. Speaker, this government has presided over more jobs and more growth, Mr. Speaker. Since the last election, what we have seen is a record year of jobs growth, of more than a thousand jobs created every single day on average, Mr. Speaker. We have seen the unemployment rate fall to 5.4 per cent. And in particular, Mr. Speaker, we have seen the number of young people getting jobs increase by over 80,000 in the last 12 months. That is the strongest rate of jobs growth for young people since 2008. More young people are getting jobs. More Australians are getting jobs, Mr. Speaker. And the reason for that is because businesses are out there investing, making things That's happen, right. and they're working under a policy environment that encourages them to do just that. And the national accounts have shown that uh, our rate of growth has, has tipped up over 3 per cent, Mr. Speaker, to put us on top ahead of all the G7 advanced nations around the world today. And we've seen non mining investment grow by a, a 10 per cent, which is five times the long run average. That is an economy where businesses are investing, taking advantage of the conditions that are in front of them to go out there and employ more people, Mr. Speaker, and give them better opportunities so they can get ahead and they can get ahead for their own families. Now, the national accounts also affirming that growth has affirmed the budget, Mr Speaker. It has validated the budget and the budget outlook because our plan for a stronger economy is working and that's why we need to stick to the plan. Because only by a stronger economy can you deliver and guarantee the essential services like Medicare and affordable medicines that the Australian people rely on. And that's why Moody's have moved to once again affirm the AAA credit rating for Australia. We are one of only 10 countries that have a AAA credit rating from all the three major ratings agencies. Now, I'm asked about risks by the member for Gray. The member single greatest immediate risk to the Australian economy is the Labor Party, Mr Speaker, for one simple reason. For one simple reason, Mr Speaker. These characters think putting $200 billion in higher taxes on the Australian economy is somehow going to help businesses employ people and somehow help people get ahead. They think the economy is something to tax. We think the economy is something to grow, Mr Speaker. And that's what we are doing on this side of the House with our policies. And you can take our policies and you can take our budget to the bank, unlike what the Shadow Treasurer has put forward with this cruel retiree tax and his $10 billion something big black hole, Mr Speaker. He stuffed it up when he announced it and he stuffed it up when he added it up. The member for Franklin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is it fair that under this arrogant and out of touch Prime Minister, a banker from Point Piper earning a million dollars will get a tax cut of over seven thousand dollars a year, while a retail worker in Strawn will only get ten dollars a week, along with a cut to the penalty rates? Isn't this what happens when a former investment banker is running the government and a former banker like Brett Whiteley is running in Braddon? The member for Gilmore will cease interjecting. The member, member for Gilmore is warned. Members on my right. 
the Prime Minister has the call. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for a question. And Mr. Speaker, Tasmania is seeing strong economic growth. It's seeing strong jobs growth. It's seeing confidence. Seeing confidence. It's seeing investment. It's seeing optimism. And you know why, Mr. Speaker? Because there is a Liberal government in Tasmania, and there is a Liberal national government in Canberra. And what we are doing is encouraging Tasmanian businesses to invest and employ, and they are doing that with a confidence and an optimism that we've not seen in Tasmania for many years. It's a beautiful thing to see. The member for Bendigo and yet will leave we have, we have, we have well, the honourable members nodding ahead. I'm glad she agrees. She clearly didn't write the question she asked. It's good times in Tasmania at the moment, and it's based on the optimism and determination of Tasmanians. And one of the important things to do, one of the important things to do is to be upfront and tell the truth. And you, we know that when you reduce taxes on business, you give greater incentives to invest and get ahead. And we know that because every government has taken that view, Labor and Liberal, for years. In fact, the honourable member's leader, the member for Maribyrnong, very eloquently said, standing right here, lower business tax means more investment, higher productivity, more jobs and higher wages. And the member for McMahon uh, went into print. He was so enthusiastic about it. So we know that, and that's providing the incentives that we're seeing in Tasmania. But it's important to tell the truth to Tasmanians. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition said on the 28th of May in, in Braddon, he said the North West Regional Hospital has had its funding cut. Well, let's have a look at that. In Labor's last full year in office, Commonwealth funding for Tasmania's public hospital, hospitals was $294 million. This year it's $418 million, an increase of 42 per cent. And that excludes the $730 million payment made to the state government in return for taking back the Mersey Community Hospital. And in terms of the new five-year funding deal, Tasmania will receive an increase, an additional $373.6 million over five years from 2020. It's going to receive all of that extra money. So what we're doing is we're providing the incentives, we're providing the encouragement for Tasmanians to invest and get ahead, and they're seeing that growth, especially in Braddon. And above all, we're showing the integrity to treat Tasmanians with respect and not mislead them, as Labor is doing. We're delivering more funding into public health in Tasmania, and the only reason we can keep doing that is because of the stronger economy supported by our economic plan. Just before I call the member for Melbourne, I'd like to inform the House that joining us in the gallery this afternoon are 17 senior parliamentary staff from a range of parliaments who are participating in the interparliamentary study program. On behalf of the House, I welcome you all here today to question time. The member for Melbourne has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. People in Melbourne are grieving at the death of Eurydice Dixon. Melbourne's full of strong, funny women like Eurydice, and this has hit us hard. Thousands of people will be gathering at Prince's Park and around the country to remember Eurydice. Many people are in mourning, many are angry, and many are both. Prime Minister, do you agree that whatever we're collectively doing as a country now to change men's behaviour, we need to do more? And will you support increasing efforts to change men's behaviour so that everyone in this country feels safe? The, member, uh, the Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for that question. Our hearts go out to Eurydice's family. Our prayers, our sympathy, our love are with them as they grieve her loss. Women must be safe everywhere, on the street, walking through a park, in their homes, at work. We need to ensure that we have a culture of respect for women. Not all disrespect of women ends up in violence against women, but that's where all violence against women begins. And so ensuring that we start from the very start, ensuring that our sons and grandsons respect the women in their lives, 
is vitally important. We all, as parents and grandparents, have a duty to do that. And also, we have a very profound duty to ensure that our public places, our streets, our parks, are safe places in which to work and walk. And I know, look, I know that we are all united in this year. This is not a partisan issue. But you know, when we sit down with states and local government and work through our city plans and city deals, a key part of that is ensuring that we have an environment that is safe. And as my wife Lucy often says in her capacity as Chief Commissioner of the Greater Sydney Commission, a measure of the livability of a city is whether women are safe to walk wherever. And that has got to be another vital priority. This is a heartbreaking tragedy. But what we must do as we grieve is ensure that we change the hearts of men to respect women. We start with the youngest men, little boys, our sons and grandsons, which make sure that they respect their mothers and their sisters and all the women in their lives. As grown men, we must lead by example and treat women with respect, and we must ensure that our cities, our towns, our country, everywhere is safe for every Australian to walk and work, whether it's a park, whether it's a workplace, whether it is in their own home. That is our commitment. I thank the honourable member for the question, and I believe, Mr Speaker, that I speak for every honourable member in saying we must never, ever, ever tolerate violence against women. Eurydice Dixon, we mourn her loss, we grieve with her family, and we say never again. The Leader of the Opposition on indulgence. I might briefly just associate the Opposition with the Prime Minister's remarks. As a Melbourneian, when we heard the news that this dreadful murder had happened at Princes Park, I felt the same shock that millions of other people feel for one who is familiar with this, uh, with this park. My own boy has trained around the very oval uh, where they found Eurydice. It is shocking. It is futile. It was just beyond belief. Not again, I thought. Not again has a woman been killed in Melbourne or anywhere in Australia to that end. Women in Australia have the right to freedom of movement. It is not the fault of women if they choose to walk home from transport to their house. All of this violence is ultimately preventable, and we need to tackle the enablers of violence. We need to change the attitudes of men. And we should commit ourselves here that nothing is off limits to prevent violence against women or indeed any Australian. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Chisholm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. Will the Minister update the House on the importance of creating a tax system that doesn't seek to punish aspirational Australians? Is the Minister aware of any threats posed by different approaches? The Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. I thank the member for Chisholm for her question and for her tireless work on behalf of her constituents. She puts in so much work day in and day out because she, like every other member of the Turnbull government team, knows how important it is to have a tax system that encourages ambition and rewards hard work so that people keep more of the money that they earn. And our personal tax plan will deliver that. It will deliver that to around 10 million Australians. And when it's fully implemented, it will ensure that 94 per cent of all Australians pay no more than 32 and a half cents in the dollar. That's 94 per cent of workers across this nation who will not have to think twice about whether they work that extra day, whether they go for that dream job, whether they get a promotion. They will know that they will have a fair tax rate. But those opposite unfortunately, are set to slug Australians with even more taxes and even higher taxes, around $200 billion worth. And that will mean an average tax bill for Australians of around $16,000 for every single taxpayer in this country, courtesy of the Leader of the Opposition. 
Now, of course, of most concern to Australians is the very regressive, damaging and lifestyle-destroying retiree tax, which will take money out of the pockets of pensioners and some of the most vulnerable retirees in this country. Around 8,500 of them in the electorate of Chisholm and around 3,500 in the electorate of Braddon, which I was visiting only the other day. Many of them older, retired Australians who have scrimped hard, worked hard all of their lives and have paid their taxes. In fact, when I was in Braddon just the other week, I heard directly from those retirees who stand to lose huge chunks of their retirement income thanks to the Labor Party's shameless tax grab. And these are not multimillionaires, as the Leader of the Opposition may claim. In fact, they're not on high incomes at all. They are overwhelmingly on very modest incomes, just trying to enjoy their retirement. These are the people that Justine Key, that the Leader of the Opposition and Labor, are turning their backs on. And these are the people that Brett Whiteley and the people like Julia Banks and everybody on this side of the coalition are working so hard to protect. Shockingly, and despite the backflips and the protests from those opposite, many pensioners, many retirees, some of the most vulnerable in our community, they will be impacted. And the Leader of the Opposition, despite all of his promises, cannot be trusted. The Australian the people time know better. Has concluded. I'd like to inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Honourable Theresa Gambero, former member for Brisbane. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you. And can I also welcome the former member for Deakin, Mr Mike Simon. Uh, I extend a warm welcome to you as well. And I call the member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can this arrogant and out-of-touch Prime Minister confirm that he is under his unfair budget a banker from Vaucluse earning a million dollars a year will get a tax cut of over $7,000 a year. His bank will get a company tax cut with $17 billion going to the big banks. But a hospitality worker from Adelaide will only get a tax cut of $10 a week, and that's before she loses $77 in penalty rates. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, uh, well thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, uh, of course, uh, if uh, the worker the honourable member referred to had been ably represented by the Leader of the Opposition's former union, the penalty rates would have been traded away years ago. <laughs> Mr Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker uh, under, under, the Labor Party's, uh, under the Labor Party's proposal on tax, a uh, public school teacher in Victoria would pay between $800 and $1,200 more tax every year. A crane operator would pay between $900 and $1,600 more tax every year. A public school psychologist in New South Wales would pay between $2,300 and $2,800 more tax every year. A forklift driver would pay between $3,800 and $4,500 more tax every year. And coming to Adelaide, a police inspector would pay between $4,000 and $5,200 more tax every year. The Labor Party, led by a man who once proposed a 30 per cent top Jagger rate Jagger of income tax, of course, the same man who proposed a 25 per cent rate of company tax, being the shadow, of his, as did his uh, offside of the shadow treasurer. Mr. Speaker, what we have with our comprehensive tax plan is one that is fair and encourages investment, it encourages enterprise, it encourages aspiration, and it is highly progressive. Highly progressive. The honourable member laughs. Well, the honourable member should be aware. The honourable member should be aware that by, but when the plan is fully rolled out in 24-25, people in the top tax bracket at paying the highest rate of marginal tax will be paying a larger share of the personal income tax take than they are today. Than they are today. And they will be paying more income tax, more of that income tax share than they are today. And the person on forty one thousand on two hundred thousand dollars will be paying more than twelve and a half times more income tax than the person on forty one thousand dollars. 
the scheme, the income tax scheme, the whole structure remains progressive. The bulk of the tax is paid by people on higher incomes, but what we're doing is encouraging aspiration, enterprise and people getting ahead, including people working in hospitality, working on lower incomes, because they too want to get ahead and earn big money, like the members of the Labor Party opposite. The member for La Trobe. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House and why it's important for government's tax policies to be implemented? How do these policies contribute to the government's plan for a stronger economy for all Australians? And are there any dangers associated with not proceeding with them? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for La Trobe for his question. Uh, the Liberal and National parties are for lower taxes. Yeah. That's what we're for. We're for lower taxes. We're for lower personal taxes. We're for lower business taxes. We believe that you should not suffocate the economy with higher taxes. We believe, Mr Speaker, that we should be providing that tax relief to all working Australians, not just some, all of them, those on lower and middle income and all those Australians who are out there working, because we believe all Australians work hard and we believe they all deserve tax relief. And we believe businesses should have competitive tax rates. We do not believe that businesses should be shackled to some, if not the second highest, tax rates in the world when they're out there trying to invest and employ people and grow their businesses and get the return back on the big investments they've made in their businesses, putting their own houses and their own livelihoods on the line to ensure that other people can have jobs and enjoy the prosperity that is achievable in this country, Mr <laughs> Speaker. That is our plan. That's part of our strong plan our plan for a stronger economy, because we understand that you cannot guarantee the essential services Australians rely on unless you have a stronger economy. The Labor Party wants to put more than $200 billion of additional taxes on the Australian economy. That's why Australians cannot afford Labor, Mr Speaker. They cannot afford a Labor government that would put more than $200 billion in additional taxes. And the way they'll pay for that, Mr Speaker, Australians, is not just in the higher taxes that they'll pay, but the threat to the services that they rely on. And if we're looking in Tasmania and the infrastructure, where the $60 million for the Bass Highway, that comes from a stronger economy, Mr Speaker. That's where that comes from. The $1.5 billion for boosting the Bruce Highway up now in the member for Petrie and in the Longman electorate, that comes from a stronger economy. The $10 million for the chemotherapy treatment unit in Caboolture Hospital, Mr. Speaker. That comes from a government that understands why a stronger economy is important to guarantee the essential services that Australians rely on. Our personal tax plan is responsible, it's comprehensive. It deals with real problems in the tax system to ensure that 94 per cent of Australians will not face a marginal tax rate higher than 32 and a half cents in the dollar. That's a real plan, Mr Speaker, and that's what we're delivering. And our enterprise tax plan will ensure that the businesses that currently employ more than one in two Australians will be joined by all businesses in having competitive tax rates so they can employ more Australians. It's under this government since we were first elected that a million jobs have been created. It's under this government that we've seen unemployment coming down, Mr Speaker. It's under this government that we've seen 80,000 young people get a job. Jobs and growth, that's what we've delivered. That's what we'll continue to deliver. The member for McMahon. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that by the time they're fully implemented, stage three of the government's personal income tax scheme and its big business tax cut will cost the budget at least $25 billion a year. Why won't the Prime Minister support Labor's plan for a bigger, better tax cut for 10 million Australians who earn less than $125,000 instead of giving $25 billion a year to big business and high income earners? The member for Deakin will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. To add to this answer, but I think it's worth noting that the question has been asked by the author of that famous economic tome, Hearts and Minds, that right? Hearts and Minds, where it's available wherever remaindering occurs, that great text which advocated a 25 per cent corporate income when it's affordable. Well, the reality is, I'll tell you when it's unaffordable. It's unaffordable when you're uncompetitive. It's unaffordable to have a company tax rate in Australia 
that is at the top of the OECD. The honourable member wrote a book and talked about the importance of having a competitive tax rate, and now, now having done that, he's been forced to eat his words and he's flinging himself in the way of a competitive member tax rate. Griffith. Mr Speaker, I'll ask the Treasurer to add to my answer. The thank Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Prime Minister for the opportunity to add to that answer. Mr Speaker, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be relying on the, the uh, shadow treasurer's figures anyway, anywhere, anytime, Mr Speaker. This is a shadow treasurer who came up with this genius of a plan to hit pensioners, retirees, all of these, strip away their tax refund. He announced it in great fanfare and he says we'll raise $59 billion and I won't change a jot of it. And then within two weeks he was tripping over himself to come out with amendments to his own policy. And then we find out that he says it will cost 55.7. So we took, Mr Speaker, his entire policy that he's announced to the Australian people, and we asked Treasury to cost that policy, Mr Speaker, and it comes, it comes, Mr Speaker, in a revenue, in a revenue of $10 billion less than he said. And he's saying, trust us, trust us, trust Labor with money. We always get it right. Well, I'm looking over there. I can't see him today. The member for Lilly he must be otherwise engaged Who's today, Mr. Speaker. Presidente? Where's the El Presidente? Now, the member for Lilly, he was a genius when it came up to adding up tax revenues on the mining tax. It's not bad enough, Mr. Speaker. It's not bad enough that they actually. There he is. He's up the back there. I've found him. He's, there he is. It's not bad enough that they can't add up, Mr. Speaker. But the problem is they go and spend the money that's not there. And that's how the member for Lilly and the member for Rankin was in there helping him every step of the way completely stuff the budget, Mr. Speaker. And for the last and for the last the five member years for almost, Sydney. we have been repairing the wreckage of the member for Lilly, ably assisted by the member for Rankin and the member for McMahon and all the other Muppets who helped him. The member for Barker will cease interjecting. The member for Fairfax. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence Industry, representing the Minister for Jobs and Innovation. Will the Minister update the House on the progress the government is making in supporting jobs and growth in the economy? And, Minister, what would be the outcome? of pursuing less economically responsible ideas. The Minister for Defence Industry, representing the Minister for Jobs and Innovation. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Fisher for his question, because he, like many members of this House, is, is delighted with the progress that the government is making in terms of jobs and growth in our economy. In the May figures for jobs, for example, it showed that the government is on track to create and support 1,031,000 jobs since we were elected in September uh, 2013. In fact, seeing unemployment drop down to 5.4 per cent, Mr. Speaker. So we promised in 2013 that we'd create a million jobs in the first two terms of a coalition government. We've actually achieved that ahead of schedule, about seven or eight months ahead of schedule, because of the policies of this <coughs> government driving jobs and growth. We, we've, we've reduced unemployment. We've increased the number of jobs, all of those people working, paying taxes, being part, full members of our economy and our society, Mr Speaker. And in fact, the national accounts also showed recently that growth for the last quarter was at 1 per cent, 3.1 per cent for the year. So we are actually not just promising jobs and growth, we are delivering jobs and growth as we said we would, Mr Speaker. The Australian economy is now back on track after six years of listless government uh, under the previous Labor administration, Mr Speaker, and the public are uh, clearly getting the benefits of that through higher wages uh, and paying less tax under this particular economy. Mr Speaker, the, the, the Labor Party cannot be trusted with the economy, and particularly the Leader of the Opposition can neither be trusted nor can the public afford a Labor government, Mr Speaker. The policies, as the Minister of Revenue outlined earlier in question time, $200 billion worth of new taxes 
hitting everybody across the board, Mr. Speaker. Their latest target, of course, are retirees and pensioners, Mr. Speaker. Retirees and pensioners, the most vulnerable uh, income earners in the economy, they are on fixed incomes. They've arranged their affairs to be able to take care of themselves. They've worked hard their whole lives. They helped build this country, and yet pensioners and retirees are the vicious target of this Leader of the Opposition and the Labor Party, Mr Speaker. They know, because they're talking to us and our electorates when we go back and speak in our electorates to, our, to the voters, they're quite worried. And why should they be frightened? Why should they be made to be frightened at this stage of their lives, Mr Speaker? Ironically, those people who can afford to change their affairs will not be hit by the Leader of the Opposition's policies. Ironically, he's tried to start a class war where the people who are the most hurt are those on low incomes, pensioners who cannot rearrange their affairs. So those who can, he can't even rearrange a class war, Mr. Speaker. So those who can afford to rearrange their affairs will do so, and the lowest incomes will be hurt under this leader of the opposition. That's right. Here, here. The leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that Natsem has said about stage three of his personal income tax scheme, and I quote? This new tax system from 2024-2025 is less progressive than the current system. It means higher income inequality. The rich get more of the tax cuts than the poor. Prime Minister, how is this fair? The Prime Minister has the point. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is, it is a fair and progressive tax reform, precisely because it gives. Australians, 94 per cent of Australians, in fact, the surety that they will pay no more than 32.5 cents in the dollar for every additional dollar they earn. Now, we, I, you know, we all remember the Dr Craig Emerson, who used to talk a great deal about effective marginal tax rates and all of the problems occasioned by that. We're very well aware of those issues. The member for Fenner has written about it. This gives you a 32.5 cent marginal tax rate from $41,000 through to $200,000. It ensures that you have every incentive for people to get ahead. And, Mr. Speaker, the approach that we're taking is one that provides benefits to Australians right in the, in the heart of that middle income area where Australians have had so many disincentives from bracket creep. It is a very positive reform, and as far as the issue about inequality is concerned, I come back to this point. After this, the plan is fully rolled out, uh, the people on the 45 cent uh, bracket, marginal tax bracket, that is who are earning over $200,000, will be paying a larger share of the personal income tax to, uh, take than they do today, and a person on $200,000 who is earning roughly five times as much as somebody on $41,000 will be paying nearly 13 times as much tax. That is a progressive tax system. The member for Barara. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the minister update the House on the progress of the US settlement arrangement and how the government's strong border protection policies have contributed to this success? In what ways could conflicting proposals undermine these positive outcomes? The Minister for Home Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. I want to thank all of my colleagues for the work that they've done in supporting the government's position to keep our borders secure. Because if you don't have secure borders, you cannot, Mr Speaker, have a safe society. And I want to make sure that we don't see children drowning at sea. We saw tragically 1,200 people drown at sea when Labor last in government. We saw 8,000 children go into detention and we saw 17 new detention centres open when Labor was in government because 50,000 people arrived Mr. Speaker, on 800 boats. I'm pleased to inform the House that yesterday a further 19 people who Labor put onto Nauru left Nauru for the United States, bringing Mr. Speaker, the total number of people lifted from Nauru and Manus Island to 286. Now, it's important, Mr. Speaker, to recognise that out of all of the people that Labor put onto Manus and Nauru, we want to make sure that we can get them off as quickly as possible. 
But we do know, Mr. Speaker, members on my left. we do know that if there are new arrivals, as the Labor Party is proposing under their change border policy programs, the new arrivals, which are a certainty under the policy that Labor is now adopting, those people will not be eligible to go to the United States under the agreement we've struck with the United States administration. It's important to point out, Mr. Speaker, because we see in by-elections around the country at the moment, we see Labor candidates pretending, pretending to support the government's position on border protection when really they don't. And, Mr. Speaker, there's no better example than Susan Lamb, who is the Labor candidate in the Longman seat in Queensland, who does not support our border protection policies. We know, Mr. Speaker, that Susan Lamb in the seat of Longman is promising a policy which would revert back to the disaster that operated under Labor. Mr. Speaker, under the Labor Party, under the Labor Party, they would undo each of the successful pillars of Operation Sovereign Borders that has seen children no longer drowning at sea, no longer in detention. We've closed those 17 detention centres, and Susan Lamb and others should at least today start to be honest with the people of Longman that the Labor Party is promising a policy where boats will restart, where kids will be back in detention. That is the reality of what Labor is promising at the moment. And Mr Speaker, the facade that the Labor Party has put up at the last election no longer stands. The left of the Labor Party has taken control of the caucus, and it is obvious that this Leader of the Opposition has lost control on border protection, and the people of Longman get it. They know that Trevor Ruthenberg is the only candidate in the, in the Longman by-election that stands for strong border protection. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The 2016 Tasmanian floods devastated many Tasmanian communities, including the township of Latrobe. Therefore, instead of continuing with his arrogant and out-of-touch policy to give $80 billion in tax giveaway to the big end of town, when will the Prime Minister adopt Labor's plan to invest $3.4 million to fund flood mitigation works in and around La Trobe to protect every single house and every business in the township from future catastrophic floods. The minister has the call. I thank the uh, leader of the opposition for his question, and of course, on this side of the house, uh, we know the importance of disaster relief and mitigation. Uh, we also know that the floods of 2016, June 2016, in north, northern and northwestern Tasmania were both devastating and tragic. Devastating and tragic. Now, Mr. Speaker, Bill Shorten, the Leader the, of the Opposition— The Minister will refer to members by their correct titles. The, the, the Leader of the Opposition made a rushed announcement yesterday. He, he can't deliver what he's promising. He's not in government, and he won't be in government after the by-election. Now, we, we have only just received a report outlining options for flood mitigation for La Trobe, partly funded by this side of the House, partly funded by this government. During the 2016 floods, the Hodgman government and the Turnbull government worked together through our national disaster relief uh, and recovery arrangements to deal with what was a devastating and tragic set of floods. The response included Category C funding of up to $10,000 for severely affected primary producers. Severely affected primary producers. We know how to deal with those problems on this side of the House. Uh, in nine local government areas, including in Latrobe, for a total of $6.6 million of funding. It also included Category D funding for $16 million worth of projects, $16 million worth of projects, including a $3 million flood mapping project for all affected local government areas. Now, the Turnbull and Hodgman government uh, again look forward to working together cooperatively with the Latrobe Council on any long-term solution that better protects residents and farmers 
from floods like this one that occurred in 2016. That's why, uh, uh, that's why Mr. Speaker, we took the view uh, some time ago that we needed a framework for disaster resilience to be revised and updated. And in April 2018, we formed a national task force within the, the Department of Home Affairs to tackle exactly this issue. Mr. Speaker, we are proud of providing assistance to communities impacted by disasters. Our government respects the processes of the La Trobe Council, which will be dealing with this issue this week, and we look forward to working with them to protect the region from future floods. The member for Murray. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on how the government is building infrastructure and, uh, which connects local communities and creates local jobs? And is the Prime Minister aware of any roadblocks to our positive plans? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Murray for his, uh, for his question. He is passionate. He is a passionate advocate for the people of regional Australia and certainly for the Victorian seat of Murray. The Liberal and Nationals government believes that your postcode should not limit your potential. No matter where you live, we believe that regional people and their community deserve essential services, and the recent budget is proof positive of that. It's helping to deliver those regional services, connect communities like never before. Essential services such as the ability to make a phone call or use the internet, safer and better roads on which to drive getting you home sooner and safer, reliable water infrastructure, jobs for families and young people in the regions, in the sea of Murray, opportunities for those who want to get ahead, Mr Speaker, building our future. Mobile communications is a service many people take for granted, but this government believes country people deserve it, and that's why we are delivering. Just last week, the Minister for Regional Communications, Senator Bridget McKenzie, announced $25 million for yet another round of the Mobile Black Spot program. This builds on the success of the Mobile Black Spot program to date, uh, which is on track to deliver 867, 867 base stations nationwide by June next year. And so now we will listen to communities again. We will hear from those people who need a better mobile service. And I hear the member for McHugh, and I mean he bleats, he belches, he huffs and puffs whenever we talk about mobile phone services. But let me tell you, he goes on about Craigie Byrne and Sunbury and, and uh, uh, Kilmore, Seymour, all those communities. But let me tell you, he, when he was in government, when he was sitting on this side, his side, Labor, did not deliver one single cent, not one single cent for mobile phone towers, and he knows it. He comes in here and he goes crook. He knows you didn't deliver one single cent. This was one part of this government's, Mr. Speaker, this government's infrastructure connecting country communities. Around Australia, we're developing, building safer roads, such as the upgrade to the Murray Valley Highway from Echuca to Yarrawonga. And the member who asked me the question seat, the member, the member for Murray, the Echuca Moama Bridge, and the, uh, certainly we're getting on with the job of more mobile phone towers. And in Braddon, in Braddon, in Tasmania, we're investing in upgrades to the Bass Highway, and I'm just pleased that the uh, Liberal candidate there, Brett Whiteley, he has he has called Labor out. He has called Labor out. Six million dollars. That's all they were spending on the Bass Highway through Braddon. Let me tell you now, it's 60 million dollars. But we're investing 400 million dollars. That's what the Liberal and Nationals are doing. That's why the people of Victoria, the people of Tasmania, regional Australians. That's why we're delivering. Regional Australians know it. The regional Australians know it, but they're onto this. They're onto this shifty leader of the opposition. They, they've, they've found you out. They've called the you out. Deputy Prime you Minister's they will in the by -election. The member for Whitlam. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm? that when he was communications minister, the government was warned that the government's cuts to the SBS could have an impact on the ability of Australians to watch the World Cup. This included the SBS CEO Michael Abid warning Senate estimates in 2014 the future World Cup coverage could be at risk because of the government's cuts. So will the Prime Minister now apologise to football fans who are complaining about second-rate coverage of the World Cup. Um, I'm not going to call the Prime Minister. Members on both sides. I'm happy to hear from uh, 
the Deputy Manager of Opposition Business on this subject in a second, but um, as I heard the question, it asked the Prime Minister about his previous ministerial responsibilities. I'll call the Prime Minister. Mm. Mm. Speaker, I think the most important thing to say about the World Cup is that we're all inspired by the determination of the Socceroos. Uh, they, played, they played the most expensive team in the world, France, and they came so close. I won't uh, express any personal views about the video referee, but uh, I think a fair-minded fair uh, fan of the French team would recognise they were very fortunate uh, to get that one goal win. And we know the Socceroos, the Socceroos played so well. We congratulate them. I thank the honourable member for giving me the opportunity to do so here in the House of Representatives, and we wish them all the best for the next game against Denmark and the whole campaign. Now, as far as, uh, as, far as streaming is concerned, I'll confirm that I spoke to the CEO of Optus, Alan Liu, today about this. Uh, he, he obviously acknowledges uh, they've had some real problems uh, with streaming uh, from, the, uh, from the Optus uh, platform. He believes that it will be. He believes he can fix it. Believes it will be fixed tonight. Uh, and obviously, uh, Australian uh, soccer fans will be expecting Optus to deliver in that regard. But thank, thank you very much, and again for asking the question. But go the Socceroos. The member for Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline to the House how a stronger economy enables the government to invest in life-saving drug and alcohol support services? Is the Minister aware of any contrary propositions that undermine the funding of health services in Queensland? The Minister for Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Bonner, who comes to this place as somebody who achieved great things as a uh, small business person. He was a restaurateur specialising in Italian food. I'd recommend the marinara. And what he knows from his time, both as a small business person and in this House, is you can't grow either a small business or an economy without a plan, without the ability to ensure that you are living within your means. And what he saw in his work and what we see in this uh, government and this economy right now is that we are seeing record growth because of the plan in jobs. And that record growth, that million jobs, allows us to invest in essential services. Essential services such as record funding for Medicare with an extra $4.8 billion uh, at, the, at the recent budget, record funding in mental health with an extra $338 million, record funding for, uh, for the pharmaceutical benefit scheme with major new drugs for breast cancer and spinal muscular atrophy being listed, as opposed to Labor's practice of failing to list drugs and record funding for hospitals. One of the things which I was able to see last week when I visited Caboolture in the seat of Longman and met with Trevor Ruthenberg, our extraordinary candidate who'd spent time in the Air Force, in the private sector, uh, who spent time uh, in the not-for-profit sector was that he saw that the number one health priority for the area was investing in drug and alcohol support services. And that's why, that's why we spent $11 million, invested $11 million, not to begin in one year or two or three or four or five years, but to begin immediately investing in drug and alcohol support for the people of Caboolture, because ice on the ground in Caboolture and in the surrounding areas was recognised as the number one task by the Primary Health Network for assessing for and Bruce. dealing and addressing going forwards. So we've responded, not just to the Primary Health Network, not just to the people of Caboolture, but, uh, but to the advocacy of Trevor Ruthenberg, or better known to the locals as Big Trev. And this plan, Big Trev's big plan for a better caboolture is all about ensuring that we have drug and alcohol and ice support on the ground. And it's not waiting one or two or three or four years like Labor. It is dealing with the problem right now, immediately, with better support, 
detox facilities, demand facilities, day rehab and overnight facilities for the people of Caboolture. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that today the Managing Director of SBS has said about the decision to licence the World Cup Games to Optus, and I quote, had we not had to look to our budgets, we probably would have retained it like we were planning to when we bought it. Therefore, when will the Prime Minister apologise to Australians and football fans for his cuts to the SBS? Members on my left, the member for Bruce is warned. The minister representing the Minister for Communications. I'm very pleased, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to have the chance to respond to what is, as is usually the case with the leader of the opposition, a uh, complete mischaracterisation of the facts. The facts are, Mr. Speaker, the facts are very straightforward. The SBS receives around $280 million in funding every year from the government. How SBS decides to use this funding is a matter for the board and management of SBS, a fairly basic principle of governance. Uh, and I do want to make the point that in exchange for sharing the World Cup rights, SBS secured some rights to the English Premier League matches over a three-year period, 2016-17, to 2018-19. In other words, board and management of SBS made a commercial decision on this side of the House. We think they are best placed to make those decisions. The member for Fisher. Oh, sorry, the Leader of the Opposition seeking to table the document. I seek leave to table the transcript where Mr Michael Abid attributed the fact of the cuts to uh, the budget. And is the leave granted? Leave is not granted. The member for Fisher. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and Energy. Will the Minister update the House on action the government is taking to reduce power prices and help families and small businesses, both in my own electorate of Fisher and across South East Queensland? Will the Minister provide an update on how alternative schemes would hurt Australian families? The Minister for the Environment. The Member for Fisher for his question. And firstly, an commiserations to the Member for Port Adelaide, Mr. Speaker. Losing to the Member for Lilly really is an insult, Mr. Speaker. Really is an insult. Now, the Member for Fisher, the Member for Fisher, the Member for Fisher knows there is a real difference between the energy policy of the Labor Party and the energy policy of the Coalition. Under the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker, your power prices will go up, Mr. Speaker. The Labor Party is the party of blackouts, Mr. Speaker, and the Labor Party is the party of reckless renewable energy targets, Mr. Speaker. Under the coalition, you'll always pay less for your power, Mr. Speaker. Now, just look at the Labor Party's look at the Labor Party's record when they were last in office. Power prices doubled, Mr. Speaker. Each and every year when the Labor Party was last in office, power prices went up. We had the dreaded carbon tax, the $15 billion dreaded carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We had the cash for clunkers. We had the pink bats. We had the citizens' assembly. Labor ignored the warnings in their own energy white paper about what it would mean for domestic gas prices to export more from the east coast of Australia, Mr. Speaker. And they gave a green light to the gold plating of the poles and wires, Mr. Speaker, something we are still paying for. Now, in contrast, in contrast, under the coalition, we abolished the carbon tax, and we saw the single biggest drop in power prices ever recorded, Mr. Speaker. We've stopped the networks gaming the system. If the Labor Party had done it, we would have saved six and a half billion dollars for consumers, Mr Speaker. We've ensured more gas is available for domestic customers before it's being exported overseas. We're getting a better deal from the retailers for millions of Australian customers, Mr Speaker. And of course the National Energy Guarantee, which has the support of the big energy users, the Blue Scopes, the BHPs, the Rio Tintos, the Irrigators, the National Farmers Federation and others, Mr Speaker, will for the first time integrate energy and climate policy and reduce power prices, Mr Speaker, and create a more reliable system. 
But in the last fortnight, Mr. Speaker, the big three have reduced their power prices across New South Wales, Queensland and South Australia, Mr. Speaker. Something you never saw from the Labor Party, because under the Labor Party, power prices went up each and every year. If you're an Energy Australia customer in Brisbane, Mr. Speaker, with a small business, a cafe or a hairdresser, you will save around $470 a year. If you're a household in Brisbane with Energy Australia, you'll save just under $100 a year, Mr. Speaker. So come these by-elections in Braddon, in Mayo and in Longman. The choice is clear, Mr. Speaker. The choice is clear. Only the coalition will deliver a more affordable and reliable power system. The member for Griffith. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. ABS statistics confirm company profits increased by 5.8 per cent over the year, nearly three times as much as wages growth of 2.1 per cent. So why does this arrogant and out-of-touch Prime Minister support further cutting the penalty rates of up to 11,850 working Australians in Longman on 1 July while he's giving an $80 billion tax cut to big business? The Prime Minister has the call. Oh, thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. The honourable member knows very well, I'm sure, because it was, as the Leader of the Opposition once said, a fact that every student of Australian economic history would be well aware of. That's what he said. Every, he said every student of Australian economic history would be aware of the fact that reducing company tax results the member for in more has investment, already been warned. higher wages, more jobs, more investment, higher productivity, all of those good things. And you know, we're starting to see them now. That's why we've got record jobs growth. That's why we've got record jobs growth. It's a very competitive world out there. The honourable members opposite should recognise the world is getting more competitive than ever. And what we need to do is ensure that every element of our tax system ensures that Australian businesses can compete and win. Can compete and win. The member for McMahon set all that out in his famous book years ago. He's munching his way through one copy of it after another. He's being forced to eat his words. It's, 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 uh, talk, about, talk about dry economics, very dry, so munching away through all those books. Mr Speaker, the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is a more competitive corporate sector results in more investment more jobs. That's why we're seeing record jobs growth. The uh, Labor Party should recover the uh, economic uh, good sense they had in years past and support our enterprise tax plan. The member for Petrie. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Urban Infrastructure and Cities. Will the Minister please update the House on how the government is delivering on its record $75 billion investment in infrastructure transport in Queensland. How will the government investment in the Bruce Highway contribute to economic growth in Petrie, Longman and surrounding areas? And what would the consequences of following other ideas be? The Minister for Urban Infrastructure. Excellent. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I do, I do thank the uh, member for Peachy for his question. He is a, uh, a great champion of infrastructure. He's a great deliverer of infrastructure. He delivered the, the Redcliffe Peninsula Line, and I well, well remember being there with, with the member at the uh, happy opening of that impressive facility. Of course, he's a very successful and experienced businessman, Mr Speaker, and he knows that you need a plan. You need a plan. You know, you need to know how to deliver. And of course, he's also part of Team Queensland. LNP Team Queensland, which is just delivering extraordinary infrastructure outcomes for the people of Queensland. $15.5 billion between 2013-14 and 2021-22. $880 million Pine River to Caloundra, including the Dolls Rock Road interchange, which will benefit and responds to the advocacy of the member for Petrie, the member for Dixon. A terrific outcome will also benefit, of course, the electorate of Longman. Uh, $800 million for Cora to Curra, Section D, responding to the advocacy of the member for Wide Bay. 
$390 million for Birbaram to Nambour, responding to the advocacy of the members for Fisher and Fairfax, and of course will also benefit the electorate of Longman. $300 million for Brisbane Metro, Mr Speaker, responding to the advocacy of the member for Brisbane. This is LNP Team Queensland delivering for the people of Queensland, delivering outcomes. The members of Team Queensland know that you need to have a plan and they know that you need a strong economy to be able to afford these projects. And so if the people of Longman would like to have more infrastructure projects, they would be well advised to choose yet another member to join the LNP's Team Queensland. Of course, they could go for yet another union official. They might think the chamber is a bit short of union officials, so they might choose to have another one. But what they might decide, based upon the evidence, Mr. Speaker, based upon the evidence, that it is the LNP's Team Queensland which is delivering unprecedented infrastructure outcomes for Queensland. If you want the big infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, my advice is to call for Big Trev. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on, on that inspiring note, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.